So, we'll be looking at Philippians. If you didn't get the uh, the memo from how much I've been talking about Philippians. Um, well, I guess... Well, I, a lot of different things. Um, the Devo for the worship team, which I guess you guys can defer that. Um, in my the past like two sermons, I, I, I mentioned Philippians... Um, I was talking somewhere, I mentioned Philippians. Like the Wednesday night that you did? Maybe. Maybe that's when it was. I know, I think it was last time you did one on a Sunday night view. I said something about Philippians. You said something briefly about it. Okay, so <clears throat> let's look real quickly at the book itself. It is written by the Apostle Paul. Um, if you don't know who that is, I mean, besides a name, he appears for the first time in the Bible in the book of Acts as a persecutor of Christians, and then he gets saved. Um, it's written in the early 60s somewhere, probably around, around like 62 or 63, but shortly before Paul was released from uh, prison in Rome. Um, its main theme is rejoice. It's a very happy book. It was written while Paul, while Paul was imprisoned in Rome, likely during a crisis of wondering if he would be dying soon. You just kind of see a little bit of a change of perspective. He was in uh, imprisoned in Rome, and he wrote th three books, and then you just kind of have this little slight delay, and then he writes Philippians, and it just seems like there's. It seems like he's either just gotten out of or is getting out of, thinking that he's about to die. So it just has a little bit of a different, different, uh, almost like a carefree feel to it. Um, so it was probably written before First and Second Timothy and Titus. Um, Paul had faced imprisonment, shipwreck, beatings, opposition, betrayal, church conflicts, death, sickness, etc., 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 etc. And from all that misery. <laughs> Uh, so, you know, besides all this nonsense that he's undergoing, it's still the happiest book in the entire Bible. Huh. Which, go figure. Okay. So this is, oh, this is kind of the situation over. You know, oh, I forgot I can do this. I can have this little yeah. sucker pop up here. Laser pointer. Let's try that one. Oh, yeah. Okay, so he heads back to back over here to, where did it go? <laughs> okay, I got it back. Don't worry, guys. <laughs> I will win. Uh, he goes back over to Jerusalem where he is arrested, exactly what um, everybody knew was going to happen. And so then he's shipped up here, and then they ship out from Sidon. Here, down around, go in Crete, and then they get lost at sea, and they're shipwrecked here, and then they eventually get back on course. So he's in Jerusalem. Let me see if I can remember all this. I think he's in Jerusalem either two years or four years in prison. I don't remember which. And then he spends another two years in Rome um, in prison. So that brings us to a question. Have you ever tried to do something but faced constant opposition and failure? Just over and over again, failure after brutalizing failure for year after year. Have you ever done something like that? No? Zachary? Uh, I think. Yeah? Want to talk about it? But I'm not sure. Oh, okay. Um, so you're just thinking maybe in the past some more? Yeah, in the past. Sometime. I gotcha. Well, you keep thinking about it. Yeah. If you think about something, let me know. Right. Check. <laughs> yeah? Um. Yeah. <laughs> Man, I tell you what, I started learning how to play the piano, and I hated that thing. But then, as soon as I picked up guitar, it just it clicked. I just got it. It was easy as pie for me. I mean, it was just like got this. Piano was. I just couldn't get into it. It wasn't my thing. <laughs> but you know, I guess everybody has their own, you know, easy time with certain things and hard time with other things. Um, I think if you'll allow me to think about this, imagine those times that you faced frustrating things. Okay, maybe you maybe you haven't ever faced constant opposition and failure, but let's just say 
you face something where you were actually trying and, and you and you failed. It could be a job or anything. Right. What do you do during those times, or what did you what did you do during those times? Just pick yourself up and just keep going at it. Yeah. Just keep moving forward. Is that what you did do, or that's what? Okay. Yeah. Check. I tried it for a while, and then I tried something else for a while. Neither <laughs> of them seemed to really mesh with me, so mm. I quit. <laughs> <laughs> was it because of John Rubin, or <laughs> just kidding? I'm just joking. Um, was that all? Okay, uh, Zach. Um, I might. I'll try it. And I'll, if I get frustrated, I might um, stop just for a minute just to look back. And I'll, maybe there might be another different way. Mm -hmm. And then I'll go back at it. Really? Yeah. Normally what I do, normally what I do is like, I do a preemptive quit. Mm -hmm. I'll look good and hard at something before I start and I say, this is a waste of time and I just won't do it. And then if I decide to do it anyways, I'll like I'll already have it in my mind that this is going to fail and I'm wasting my time. So I won't like I'll still give the my best effort that I can, but the, right. at the same time I'm like I'm You're not overly already. surprised if it fails. I'm like, eh, right. I really didn't expect this to, to go to go well. A good example of that is uh, becoming the associate pastor of music and disaster. <laughs> I was like, this is not going to go well. And so far it's gone well. I'm very surprised and just waiting for it to kind of implode on itself. Mm -hmm. Waiting, you know, something's yeah. gonna go badly. Either, right. you know, Dad and I are gonna have this super eruption, or people are just gonna say, "Hey, let's get someone more qualified," or I don't know, something's gonna happen somewhere along the way. It's like, yeah, I, I should've seen that one coming. Uh, but if I'm honest, I don't know if I can ever say that I've faced something and, con and faced constant opposition and failure. I I don't know if I ever have. <laughs> I've got a very adaptable personality, yeah. but not necessarily a very happy personality. <laughs> so, like, for instance, I was able to adapt to the piano, but I didn't like it. And right. I didn't even try to like it, if that kind of makes sense. Yeah. So I don't know if I can ever say about anything in my life that I've really pushed through and was the bigger person. Wow. I think most of the time we just quit on stuff. Wow. Baseball, for instance. Wow. I sucked, so I quit. I mean, <laughs> even after my parents signed me up with... Without me wanting to be signed up, I was just like, eh, I quit. <laughs> right. So, like, I was still there, but I wasn't really... There, there. I was like a turd out there. I was like a turd in a, in a lawn, you know? You just, yeah. what are you going to do with it? Just sit there. And... Yeah. But uh, why I asked that question, and I think it's pretty obvious, we have Philippians where Paul goes through all this nonsense, and he seemed, he seemed like he was still on his A-game. Yeah. And if I'm honest with myself, it just seems like that it's just so far beyond what I think I would do. I think, A, I don't think I would have gone to Jerusalem in the first place. I'd be like, you know what? You're right. I'm going to be arrested. I'm not going to Jerusalem. That's a bad idea. Yeah. And then second off, I don't think I would be um, overly concerned with writing other people to encourage them when I was the one in prison. I think I would be saying, hey... Where's my notes? <laughs> you need to write me a letter of encouragement because I'm in prison. <laughs> right, exactly. Well, where's my... Uh, I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe uh, maybe if I was placed in the situation, I would somehow rise above. I just don't think I would. <laughs> I, I know me, and I just I just uh, don't think I would. Right. So, Philippians 1 through 11, starting verse 1 through 2. Paul and Timothy, bondservants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi, including the overseers and deacons, now, I'm not quite sure what the significance is, but I don't know of any other letter that says specifically, including the overseers and the deacons. Yeah. I just thought that was interesting. But anyways, um, number, uh, verse 2, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So we have just a very brief introduction. Right. Basically saying, hey, it's us, blessings. So that takes us to verse to verses uh, 3 through 5. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always offering prayer with joy in my every prayer for you all, in view of your participation in the gospel from the first day until now. So we have a little bit of kind of circular things, and the reason why is because in, in Greek this makes more sense. In English it just sounds like he's repeating himself, but in Greek it's a way of emphasizing your point. 
So I'm going to try and get us to just be able to wade through this. Um, so Paul is thankful for them because of their support and Christian activity. Let's break this up. Okay, I thank my God. Okay, so, I'm, so he's thankful in all my remembrance of you. He's always he's always thankful of them of them every time that he every time that he thinks about them, always offering prayer with joy in my every prayer for you all, in view of your participation in the gospel. So because of what you have done in, in support of the gospel, that makes me joyful and I'm thankful in my prayers. Okay, so okay. just to kind of, and I know it's kind of confusing. I had to read through this a few times to really get <laughs> what the heck you're even talking about, Paul. Is there no <laughs> other way you could have said this? But you know. Some things just I kind of guess kind of get lost in translation. Yeah. For I am confident of this in verse six um, of this very thing that he who began a good work and you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. So they say whenever you see a four, you look to see what it's there for, specifically there for. But if the word itself for is I think follows the same rule. So he says, for I am confident of this very thing. What do you mean for I am confident of this very thing? You just said the thing about being. It really took me a, hard, a long time to piece this together. Um, so basically, God will continue his work in Christians who continue in their good deeds. So, okay, Paul is thankful for them because of their participation in the gospel, which because of this, their participation in the gospel, he's confident that God will continue the work that he's doing in them. Okay? So now we're, now we're piecing together the, the bits of this very confusing introduction. <laughs> right. So the long story short, God is going to continue his work in Christians who continue in their good deeds. So I already took the extra step and applied it to us today. That takes us to verses 7 through 8. But here's the thing. If you read verse 8 before 7, it actually makes more sense. Okay, so this is 7 through 8. For it is only right for me to feel this way about you all because I have you in my heart. Feel what way about you? We'll hop down to verse 8. For God is my witness how I long for you all with the, with the affection of Christ Jesus. Okay, all right. So he's talking about how he greatly cares for them. It is only right for me to greatly care about you, to feel this way. Okay, this makes more sense. Because I have you in my heart, since both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you all are partakers of grace with me. So now we hit another little piece of this puzzle. Paul and the Philippians have formed a deep bond by their support of him and by their Christian activity itself. So they're doing these two things. They're supporting him, and they are at, they're growing in Christ. They're, at, they're doing the work of the church. Okay, good good things, and that's helping them to become closer. So he's got this bond with them. Okay, all right. All right. So now we see that the joy in verse 4, always offering prayer with joy in my every prayer for you, is from the bond that was formed that he's talking about in 7. Right. So, okay, let's kind of break apart what's happening here. These Philippians are doing a good job as Christ's disciple, and they're being supportive of him, mm -hmm. which has caused them to have a good bond. Okay. Now, because of this bond, Paul, when he's praying, is always careful to thank God for them because he's it, it, it always conjures in his memory all the good stuff that they've done and, and, and how it brings him joy. Okay, so this is starting to come together. So he's confident that, they're, that, that God's going to continue a work in them, because they're allowing themselves to grow in Christ. Okay, so this is all coming together now. So, um, <clears throat> so we have. Think of it like an upside down uh, pyramid. Okay. In verse three, I'm thanking God in all my remembrance of you. Verse six, for I'm confident of this very thing that He who began a good work will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. Verse seven, for it's only right for me to feel this way because. Um, I have you in my heart. Okay, so we've got like a little bit of a... He's getting more specific here. Okay, so let's go to verse 9 now. And this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in real knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve the things that are excellent in order to be sincere and blameless until the day of Christ, having been filled with the fruit of righteousness, which comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. So here we have a little bit of, an, of a um, progression. First off, love, kind of like a feeling. And this I pray that your love may abound still more and more in real knowledge and all discernment. So that takes us to step two, discernment. Not just love as a feeling or as a, as a temporary thing, but that, that that love would cause a growth into discernment. okay? And that the discernment would cause them to be blameless and ha bear the fruit of righteousness. So look at this. 
Um, this I pray that your love may abound still more and more in real knowledge and all discernment. There's taking the love to discernment so that you may approve the things that are excellent in order to be sincere and blameless until the day of Christ Jesus. Okay, so the love that leads to discernment that leads to their blame, staying blameless. Okay, all right. So here we see that love is more than just a feeling. It is a process of moving towards something, love that causes them to be blameless before God. Okay, all right, now we're headed somewhere. Now let's come back to this. Until the day, okay. Which, look in verse 11, having been filled with the fruit of righteousness, which comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Having been filled. So now we have to look back at 10. What is he saying? Having, it, it's already happened. What? what? <laughs> so you hop back to verse 10. It says, so you may approve the things that are excellent in order to be sincere and blameless and having been filled with the fruit of righteousness. As your love grows into discernment, you will get the fruit of righteousness, which is being blameless. Does that kind of make sense? Mm -hmm. So you, the, he's talking about these things all kind of connected. Now, this took me forever to figure out what the heck he's talking about. <laughs> so before we go any further, does anybody have any questions about what was just said? <laughs> I know it was very <laughs> – there's just a lot going on in these 11 verses, guys. Wow. But if you just stop and think about it, especially if there's a different – can I see your Bible? That's a CSB, right? Yep. This actually I think might say it in a little bit better way, yeah, of a way. Might. And I pray this, that your love will keep on growing in knowledge and every kind of discernment, growing in knowledge and discernment, okay, so that you may approve the things that are superior and may be pure and blameless in the day of Christ. And how would that be accomplished? Filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. So if you kind of insert 11 and 10, it actually makes more sense. And I pray this in verse 9, that your love will keep on growing in knowledge and every kind of discernment, filled with the fruit of righteousness, so that you may prove the things that are superior and may be pure and blameless. Kind of makes more sense if you kind of rearrange it like that. Right. Now, once again, we're not trying to rewrite the Bible. I'm no. just trying to reword things so that you can kind of get what he's saying a little bit better. Try to understand that. Because if you read it in, in NASB, it says in verse 11, having been filled with the fruit of righteousness. So he's going backwards after we already went forwards, and it's like, yeah. you can't do this, Paul. No. Let's start at the beginning, and when you get to the end, stop. <laughs> <laughs> but anyways... Um, so this is a way in verse uh, in chapter in verses eight through seven. This is a way, a little tactfully rhetorical way, mm -hmm. of getting them to move forward in in their walk. Mm -hmm. If you go back to verse seven, it is only right for me to feel this way because I have you in my heart. You've done all these things. Great for God is my witness. How I long for you all. What's his point there? His point there is he's trying to encourage them to move forward. So then you get into verses nine through eleven, and you see that he's trying to encourage them to take their love to its logical conclusion. Okay, so now we're talking about what's the point of this stuff that he's talking about in 9 through 11? Having been filled with the fruit of righteousness, why? To the glory and praise of God. That's the point of all these talking here and talking about here. So after you get past that, Philippians gets a lot easier to understand. That little bit was just confusing. <laughs> Guys, whew. Okay, so now we get to verse 12. Now I want you to know, brethren, that my circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel, so that my imprisonment in the cause of Christ has become well known throughout the whole Praetorian Guard and to everyone else, and that most of the brethren, trusting in the Lord because of my imprisonment, have far more courage to speak the word of God without fear. Okay, this is way easier to understand. So bad things have been turned for the greater good is basically what he's saying. My bad situations have been turned to good. Um... I have a greater witness. I've been able to witness to all the Praetorian Guard, and the brothers have greater boldness. So there's two very big things that have come, good things that have come from this bad situation. Verses 15 through 18, some to be sure are preaching Christ even from envy and strife, but some also from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, rather than from pure motives, thinking to cause me distress in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in this I rejoice. Now, uh, there's a lot of things that he's saying here, so let's kind of take it a little bit smaller. Some are being antagonistic to Paul. They're opposing him. Okay? But on the bright side, Christ is proclaimed. See, they're trying to, they're trying to make it like a competition. Yeah. 
So they're preaching Christ, but they're not doing it out of pure motives. They're doing it to kind of like try to one up Paul and to somehow, you know, prove him wrong. And, you know, right. and rather than getting upset about it, Paul's answer is at least Christ is being proclaimed. Right. Now, we actually have something very similar that happens today. Um, there's still, even here in Tularosa, there's a big competition among pastors about trying to outdo each other. <laughs> you know what I mean? You got this church over here and this church over here, and they're all like, they all see themselves as, oh, I got to yeah. do better than them. Eh. I mean, at least Christ is being proclaimed. Right. I mean, that's the, the main. Right. And, and, and so it is frustrating. Imagine somebody else competing with you in such a stupid thing as trying. <laughs> We're trying to get people saved. Like, what, what's the competition here? But at least, at least he's being, at least he's being proclaimed. Um, so, um, yes, and I will rejoice uh, at the end of verse eighteen, and that which takes us into nineteen. For I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through uh, through your prayers and the pr provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Now, how do you know that? Paul, how, how, how do you know that? He says, I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayers and the provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. How do you know that? So let's hop ahead to verse 20. According to my earnest expectation. Wait, wait, wait. So you're saying you simply believe, and so that means that all everything that you believe is going to come to pass? And everything's going to go hunky-dory, and just because you, you had... Good fuzzy feelings? <laughs> See, that's not what he's saying. That's what it sounds like he's saying, but that's not really what he's saying. So let's ah. hold on. Back up to verse 19 again. Um, rejoicing or um, enduring the situation will vindicate Paul. It will prove him of mm. being noble because of their prayers and the Holy Spirit, which will strengthen him to continue. So there's two things there that will make him able to continue on. The saints praying for him and the Holy Spirit strengthening him, okay? Mm -hmm. For I knew for I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayers and provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Okay? So what what is he saying there? You look back at the in verse 18, and I will rejoice. Okay? So what he's saying here is his rejoicing will pr will, will prove him. And he knows that he will be able to rejoice because they're praying for him and because the Holy Spirit will strengthen him. Can I get in the picture here? So now we get to verse 20. Um, according to my earnest expectation and hope that I will not be put to shame in anything, but that with all boldness Christ will even now as always be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. Notice that part. Mm -hmm. That's how we know that he's not saying that. This is what it sounds like he's saying. Everything's going to be okay because I believe. But right there we know that that's not what he's saying. Whether by life or by death. That's completely different than what it sounds like he's saying. So now that, that's the missing piece of the puzzle. Whether he lives or dies, Christ will be exalted. So Paul will not be put to shame if they pray for him and the Holy Spirit strengthens him. Him being put to shame is not him dying. Him being put to shame is not bad things happening to him. Him being put to shame is not those other people preaching... So to try to get a one-up on him. None of those things would put him to shame. So, Paul, what are you saying would put you to shame? Hold on, let's back up and look at this. And I will rejoice. For I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayers and the provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. According to my earnest expectation, I hope that I will not be put to shame in anything, but that with all boldness, Christ will even now as always be exalted in my body. Right there. That Christ would be exalted. That is what would shame him is if God was not, Christ was not exalted. And what he's saying is, I know that I won't be put to shame. I know that Christ will be exalted whatever happens. Whether I have or whether I don't have, whether I stay in prison or whether I get out of prison, whether I'm killed or whether I lived, I know that I won't be put to shame because me being put to shame would mean Christ would be ex wouldn't be exalted, but I know Christ will be exalted. His whole perspective is Christ being exalted to the point that what he's really praying for is for them to pray to pray and for the Holy Spirit to strengthen him so that Christ would be exalted whether in his life or in his death. Are you getting what he's saying? Yeah. This is a powerful thing. We think us being shamed is, well, I prayed for a jet and I didn't get it. Well, I lost my job. I me, 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 all about me. That's not what Paul's saying at all. 
His sole purpose of what he's talking about is Christ being exalted. Wow. Paul, are you aware that you've been shipwrecked and all this crap has happened to you? Are you aware of how bad your situation actually is? Why are you still concerned about Christ being exalted? Like, wow. Now we get the whole picture clear, and that's why he's going to keep on rejoicing. So that Christ will be exalted, because he knows that as he rejoices, and as they're praying for him, and as the Holy Spirit is strengthening him, strengthening him Christ will, will be exalted, whatever happens. Now that... That is a is a is a focus that allows him to have the hope that he has throughout this book. Wow, wow. So okay, it sounds like Paul is saying he won't be put to shame just because he has hopes that something will happen, like name it and claim it. But we just looked. That's not what he's saying. So okay. Any questions on any of that? Okay, we're gonna stop there. Um. So now. Uh, n next week we'll look at the rest of chapter 1 and we might get into chapter 2. So if you notice, the passage that we're memorizing for this um, section is Philippians 2, 1 through 5. So you'll be memorizing something that we're actually studying. Hopefully that will help you be able to memorize it quicker, right. understand what you're memorizing, that kind of stuff. Um, but here's an opportunity for five extra points. Okay, oops, sorry. If you read through Philippians three times in this month, you will get five extra points. All you have to do is read through Philippians three times. That's it. And Philippians is a very short book. You can probably have the whole thing read in 20 minutes. I don't know how fast you are reading, but if you're really fast, probably 15 minutes. And if you're really slow, probably 30 minutes. That's not bad. That's not bad. So five extra points. Remember that. All you have to do is read it three times. So the riddle of the week, guys. Feed me and I will live, yet give me a drink and I die. My phone's all, hey. Hey, it's 725. Hey. 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 <laughs> I like those videos where they show the animals, um, like, you know, like a little kitten or something meowing or something, but then they oh, they voiced up and it's like, hey! Like the goats, the screaming. Yeah. 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 Ah! Swift yeah. yeah. What about on that song? Oh my gosh. <laughs> 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 That's so funny.